What's up, Grinder School? This is Characters. I am continuing to bring to you the Adjusting to Player Type series today, and we have now reached episode number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, which is neutralizing the lag reg. Last time we talked about the tag and how it was a bit tougher to sort of develop strategies to play, to play against the tag because he didn't have any obvious leaks and you sort of had to work out what he was doing wrong. Although there were a few little niches that you know would apply to any tag that you can use to exploit them. Um, it's much of the same today, I mean the lag is basically similar to the tag in the sense that they're both very sound in the way that they approach very general aspects of the game such as how to play before the flop, like with what frequencies to raise and what frequencies to call and neither are making like very big mistakes. The lag however, his strategy is definitely more subject to being able to make mistakes, like it's, it's definitely a lot harder to be able to be a good lag than it is to be a good tag. Like you can train yourself to be a good tag reg and then if someone told you you had to open up your ranges and play like 27, 21 instead of the 2016 that you're used to, you might find it really difficult and so it does take a good amount of skill to pull off actually being a profitable lag. Um, we'll get into the video and talk about what ranges of stats actually um, what ranges of stats actually render someone a lag rather than a tag and where to sort of draw the line and where to sort of where the cross off point is where you know there's obviously something in the middle um, which is known as a slag which is quite a funny word for a semi loose aggressive player um, but yeah I'm going to sort of encompass that within the lags today like anyone who's not a tag basically we're going to be talking about um, still to come in the series we've got like the more general video up next which is how to spot player types so stay tuned for that that's going to be pretty cool I hope where we're going to talk about little things that you can sort of pick up on little clues to what kind of opponent your what kind of player your opponent is even though you've only got like six hands on the guy and you don't have the stats to look at and you don't have the observable behaviors because remember we've been breaking up the identification of each player type into two ways one is the stats of the player for those of you who rely heavily on a HUD and just sort of multi-table which is fine and those of you who maybe you live players or people who just play a few less tables who have you know, got the opportunity to really pay attention to what their opponents are doing, even when they're not involved in hands, then you've got the observable tendencies and behaviours for those of you who are that way inclined. So let's get into the video about how to neutralise the lag reg. And notice that I've said neutralise as opposed to, you know, targeting or exploiting or how to play against or whatever. Basically because the lag reg and the tag reg, the tag reg both of them are playing a solid strategy so it's more about neutralizing that strategy than it is like directly refuting it and exploiting them you're sort of finding the best way to cope with what they're doing and hopefully you're going to be plus EV against them um, but yeah you're not always I mean especially if you're out of position to one of these players a lot of the time you are going to be negative EV but you're there you know money and poker and six max will travel to the left all the time basically so whoever's in position is going to be making money from the people who are out of position of course that's not always the way because there might be some terrible fish or nits who just lose money to everyone but if you sit six decent regulars down money's going to flow to the left so it may be that you're negative EV against someone like a, a good lag but if the table's good enough and you're making enough money from the players to your right then that's going to be fine it's just a case of neutralizing what you're losing neutralizing their game and sort of minimizing what you're losing to them and breaking even or winning if possible against them even if you're out of position if you're in position you're obviously looking to make as much from them as you can so hopefully that's the sort of idea behind this episode and we'll hopefully teach you how to do that against the lag as best as I can so we're gonna again go through the usual sort of format of these videos we're gonna talk about the stats then we're gonna talk about the behavior like I said there's a distinction there based on what kind of player you are and how you go about obtaining your reads. And then we're going to talk about pre-flop strategies, what can we do to combat the wider opening ranges of reg, what implications this has in early position, late position, all that sort of stuff. And then we're going to move on to post-flop, where we're going to talk a bit about how we can attack these wider ranges post-flop and what they mean and what a more aggressive player, you know, what sort of adjustments can we make against someone with a higher degree of aggression post-flop. And then we're going to get on to some example hands. And what I've done this time for the example hands is pick the same lag regular. And I think I've got three or four hands, I think four, where we basically play against him and we're sort of developing a dynamic and we have like lots of reads on him. So, you know, this is this differs from the previous videos. I know I keep saying this, but when you get like fish, whales, maniacs, 
um, passives, nits, all these guys are very easily exploitable just per se, just like general adjustment to exploit their game, right? But of course the tags and lags are very specific. specific. There are some general adjustments you can make, but if you want to actually like beat these guys, it's very specific, like you have to pay very close attention and you have to make sure that you're changing up your game based directly on the specific weaknesses of that player and not just on some general strategy because that won't get you very far. You know, thinking players like regulars, likes and tags generally are always always sort of thinking what they should expect from your game. They're always trying to put you in a range. They're always sort of thinking about how you're reacting and what they should do, you know, in response. Poker is just a game of everyone reacting to adjustments. And as you adjust, they adjust, as you adjust, they adjust, and the cycle goes on. Whoever does that the best usually wins. So that's kind of how it works. Um, so yeah, you do need to pay close attention. So these hands I've picked out are a sort of building reads, and based on that specific type of lag, or that specific lag himself, we are then choosing our line. So that should hopefully be quite interesting, and should be a contrast to general stuff, such as opening 2.5x instead of 3x because the guy's in it. That's a general adjustment. These are more specific read-based hand reading sort of sort of stuff so look forward to that um, so identifying them by stats they're gonna have a higher VPEP and PFR remember we said the tag is gonna range between like sort of 1816 the tight tag to sort of maybe like you know 2319 or something like that these are all tight aggressive stats the the lag is gonna range from more like 2425 VPEP Um he's still gonna have like a relatively small gap between VPEP and PFR remember because he's very much aware of optimal preflop strategy, he's not going to be limping all the time, he's not going to be cold calling garbage out position and stuff like that. So 25-21 is probably the bottom end of lag right up to sort of 33-25. One other thing to note with the lag stats are, you know, they can, the VPIP PFR gap is going to inevitably be a bit bigger because, I mean you will get some lags who play like 33-31 and have a very small gap and just never cold call, but that probably just means that they're opening too much. Like usually half of the lags adjustment of, you know, from playing looser comes from like cold calling more hands and defending his blinds more generally he's gonna have like a lower full blinds to steal he just wants to play more pots and use his skill edge against his opponents to outplay them like that's basically his strategy the more situations that are you know decent that he can get himself into of course he won't flat garbage because no amount of skill is going to make that plus EV to flat 7-4 suited out the blind to a hijack open for instance. But what he is going to do is find situations that the tag with a bit more limited skill might not consider favourable. But the lag will think that he can outplay his opponent and play optimally enough post flop such that it's fine for him to open 8-7 suited on the hijack to balance at various range. And it's fine for him to defend jack-9 suited against the button open because he thinks that the hand plays well enough and that combined with his skill edge is going to give him a plus EV scenario. So, the point is that the lag stats are going to have a bit of a bigger gap, but that doesn't mean that we should start calling him a, a passive or a fish or a maniac just because he's got a bit of a bigger gap. It just means that he is playing a few more hands without the initiative because that's one of the ways in which he's loosening up his game from that of the tags. Okay, so he's typically going to be very positionally aware. Like a good lag reg is going to be doing the majority of his increased opening on in the later positions such as the cutoff and the button and the small blind. He should be targeting blinds so when he's in the small blind he's attacking the hell out of you if you're not defending. And a good lag will be able to adjust and sort of take the foot off the gas if you're showing adjustments as well. So, I mean there's definitely a difference between a good lag and a bad lag but we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, so he's generally going to be very light in position. Um, but he's also going to be a bit lighter in the first two seats in the hijack and under the gun as well. Like he'll be varying his range a lot more basically in those spots. Um, whereas a typical tag might just only open under the gun, ace queen plus and you know sixes plus or something like that. The If he's a tight tag the lag is going to be opening those hands and then throwing in some stuff that makes his range a lot more polarized such as like 10-9 suited. It's not going to be like a direct descent of hands as you'd see them in poker stove as like a chart these are the top 10 percent it's not necessarily going to be like that the lag is more more likely to be sort of varying his range well by opening stuff like all pocket pairs you know maybe like king queen plus ace 10 plus and then throwing in some stuff like 10 8 suited from time to time because again he thinks that the disguise of the hand balancing his range combined with his skill edge is going to make his play profitable and if he's a good enough lag to pull off then he makes a very dangerous opponent so yeah, he will be positionally aware, like opening everything in late position, but he will be throwing stuff into his early position range as well, for sure. 
Um, he's going to have like a high 3-bet usually, these guys like to, they're opportunistic, you know, they like to find spots to get fold equity before the flop from their opponents, so there'll be a lot of sort of 3-betting, 4-betting going on in Lag's game. Basically, the Lag has weaker ranges, so he has to defend those ranges, like, he's going to have to 4-bet a bit light, because he's opening so much, people are going to 3-bet him a lot, and he has to, he's going to 3-bet really light, because that's just the style of his game to pick up a lot of money pre-flop but he can get away with it and if he's like feared by his opponents then of course he'll get a lot of folds before the flop so 3-bet and light is generally a, and some of them will even 5-bet light because you know people 4-bet and, and a reaction to people 3-betting so the lag will be like 5-bet and light sometimes as well but all that's sort of player dependent but usually a, a lag you know generally speaking will have a high 3-bet percentage such as like 7% or higher generally and I've seen I've seen lags at 3-bet sort of 15 to 20% out of the blinds and stuff like that, which is very, very difficult to make profitable. You have to be a very skillful player to be able to play such weak, wide ranges and not get owned, especially out of position. But in position, the lag is, and where lag is going to sort of go to town with three bits. Um, he's also going to be like very aggressive post flop over multiple streets. More so, more so than an attack, like barreling is something that the attack will do in favourable situations, generally speaking of course, but the lag is more inclined to go for more fold equity, like the lag has a weaker range, so if he's just constantly firing c bets and giving up, people are just going to be floating all the time knowing he has loads of air in his range, so he does have to mix in some 2 and 3 barrels, so a common characteristic as well for identifying a lag player is he's going to be have a higher aggression factor relative to his VPEP and PFR, which is higher. Remember, the more hands you play, the lower, you know, as a whole, your aggression factor should be because you just have weaker ranges. But the lag is going to have a high aggression factor for, you know, playing a wider range. So if you've got a lag and a tag, right, an 18-16 and a 26-21, and both, both of them have the same aggression factor, what that means is that they're not equally aggressive, but in fact the lag is actually more aggressive because he has air more often, he doesn't connect as well with most flops, you know, as well as the tag does. So if his aggression is on par with the tag, then he's certainly throwing in more bluffs, light barrels, light triples, doubles, whatever. So that's something to bear in mind. But the leg is going to be aggressive over multiple streets, usually. Because if he's the sort of guy that's going to open seriously wide, always see bet and then give up, he's clearly a bad lag, he's very exploitable, and you can just float the flop and then fold to his turn bet. So a good lag will definitely have that incorporated into his game. Um, in terms of observable behavior, you're just going to see this guy open many, many pots. You get like the lag live who's just like laid back, flinging money in, opening up every single pot he plays, and he's going to have a wider range from all positions in the tag, generally. I mean, you will get some lags who, a few of them who actually have similar ranges in the first two seats and then just go crazy in late position. That's definitely a style of lag. So make sure, as always, I know I always stress this, but when someone opens and you're deciding what to do based on how wide they're opening, check they're open by position. Don't just look at the PFR number on its own because it's very rarely going to tell the whole story. He's going to be more balanced. Like I said, he's going to be throwing in more stuff to his preflop range. Like he's not going to have a generic range that just slides down the scale of the top 10% to 20% of hands. He's going to actually throw in some stuff to balance his range. That makes him more difficult to play against post-flop because, you know, against the tag you can say well he never has 6-8 here on this 9-7-5 board so we can take straights right out of his range but the lag might have 6-8 suited in his hijack opening range or whatever so you've got to be aware of that for sure makes it just it's harder to put a lag on a range than it is to put a tag on a range basically and you're like you're likely to make more mistakes so that's why if a lag is good and it's very dangerous He's going to be opportunistic, you know. If you're if you've got leaks in your game, the good lag is going to actually look at look at what you're doing and find an area that you're playing suboptimally, and then he'll then adjust so he's taking advantage of that and exploiting it. For instance, if you fold far too much to three bets, he is going to three bet you relentlessly until you do something about it. So if you're not comfortable doing that, don't play out of position to a bad leg, a, a good lag. Just leave the table. Um, you know. It's good for your game to play out of position to these guys because it's like the toughest test you can really get in poker is to be out of position to a strong player, especially one who's playing loads of hands and making your life hell. But if you've got a couple of these guys to your left, it's rarely worth staying on the table unless you've got some huge fish to your right or something like that to compensate. So yeah, a bad lag though is definitely a spewy fountain of chips. A bad lag tries to be like he wants to be 
Um, I don't know who's a lag, famous lag from poker right now. Man, I'm so out of touch with live poker, it's terrible, but... Come on, think of some... Who's a laggy player? There's probably loads of them. But anyway, like, if if he's, like, a... He's trying to copy someone from the television who's, like... Maybe, like, Gus Hansen. Like, someone like that who plays loads and loads of hands and mixes up his ranges and is very... Very balanced in that he just plays loads of random stuff. I mean, and a lot of guys will try to emulate that. And they'll read some forums and watch some videos and they'll try to become like the online Gus Hansen or whatever and they'll be playing like loads and loads of hands and they'll fail miserably because they're just too aggressive in all the wrong spots and you get this a lot at 50 NL and even at 100 NL people are generally more solid. The lags you get at 100 are more likely to be actually good, you know, decent lags certainly and as you move up in the stakes you'll run into some really talented lags. But you know, 50 NL and below, anyone who's playing sort of 28, 24, I'd be quite happy to sit with them because they're likely just far too aggressive in all the wrong spots and they're likely just to spew and you can induce a lot of stuff from them and stuff like that. So yeah, I definitely wouldn't be wouldn't be too afraid of lags up until you get to like 100 no limit because there are very few good ones. Like I said at the start of the video, it's a very difficult style to play effectively. So most people who play this style at the micro stakes are going to be spewing a lot of money. They may still beat the fish. But, you know, they're not going to be big winners or anything like that. So a bad lag is great, especially if you have position on him, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, you're not automatically going to know how to beat this guy, but once you've found out the horrible things the bad lag is doing, you can just really go to town on them. So just be observant, take lots of notes, and tag him as a bad lag, tag him as a bad reg as opposed to a good one, so you know you want to sit with him, table select, you know, common sense stuff. A good lag is very dangerous, like we've been over, he's playing more hands, he's very unpredictable, he's aware of what you're doing, he's thinking. Generally you just want to avoid someone like that. If you encounter a good lag, the last thing you want to do is set out position to him, and you may not even want to set the same table unless there's like something that makes it worthwhile. So there's no point being all match about it and trying to be the best player and outplay everyone, because you can't outplay everyone. There, You're going to run into lots of better players during your poker career, we all are. We all sit with better players every day. Although we may beat the majority of our opponents, there's always going to be people who are better than us. So if there's a really good lag, there's no point sitting there like this money to be made elsewhere. Swallow your pride and move move on. That's my advice. Pre-flop strategies. So firstly, the thing that the lag's doing, the main difference between the lag and the tighter regular is that the lag is opening a lot more hands. So if you can recall, we spoke about tags and nits, and against those guys, the last thing you really want to do is be flatting like ace jack against or under the gun opens. However, if you look at a, a lag who's like playing 33, 27, and then has under the gun opening range of like 20% or something like that, then that's actually a lot of hands. So ace jack then moves from being like a dominated marginal piece of crap to actually being a dominating strong hand that has a load of his opening stuff like queen jack suited, king jack suited, king jack off, all these hands dominated and all his suited aces or whatever. So it's going to play extremely well against the lag. So what we actually need to be doing is against the lag who's opening wider is modifying the hands that we cold call against his open raises by making sure that we're calling more sort of big cards that dominate his range and we're not calling so many implied odds hands. So, like I said before, like when you have implied odds, you generally have lots of reverse implied odds as well. Not with the same hand, but with your range in general. When there are implied odds, there are always reverse implied odds. And when there are no implied odds, there usually aren't too many reverse implied odds. And this thing, this sort of mantra holds true here as well, because there aren't many implied odds against the lag in that many spots, because for not only is he like an aware player who's thinking and he's able to make like folds and stuff post-flops, he's not going to pay you off as often, but also his range is wider and he's going to miss the flop more, so when you connect and make your set or make your straight or flush, it's more often that the lag actually has air than the net or the tag does because he doesn't have as such a high concentration or frequency of over pairs or big cards to flop top pair or top kickers with. He's just more likely to have missed flops or flop marginal pairs when he flops pairs and stuff like that. So it's harder to get his money. There aren't as many implied odds. That means that reverse implied odds aren't so bad either because if his range isn't really strong, then when we flop our top pair hands or like our second pair hands and stuff like that, they're just good a lot more often because he has weaker stuff and weaker pairs. So we want to move away from set mining, suited connector mining, and playing all these sort of hands against the lag. Then we want to move more towards sort of playing hands that can dominate them, like king, queen, ace, jack, these hands that you would think twice about, you know, 
playing without any initiative, especially out of position against a reg, a tight reg, but against the lag, if he opens in the cutoff and you've got, you know, ace 10, you're probably going to defend with it just because you, especially ace 10 suited, because you dominate so much with range, or like, queen jack suited is always good for a defend against someone with a really wide range, not only does it play well, flop lots of semi-bluffing opportunities, but it also dominates a lot of the hands he's opening, and is actually in pretty decent shape, and our pairs are actually a lot stronger than they would be against a tighter villain, so remember that distinction, implied odds, reverse implied odds, you know, when you have one, you generally have the other. Against the lag, we don't have too much of either. Unless he's a bad... If he's a bad lag who's just, like, spewing off chips all the time, then maybe we do have implied odds. In that case, that doesn't mean to say we have reverse implied odds as well, because it's a different kind of implied odds. That's more from him being really bad as opposed to him having a really strong range. So, against a bad lag, you know, you can still set mine, you can still try and flop big hands, but against a good a good lag who isn't going mental and just spewing all his money away post flop you need to be a bit more selective and you want to really start dominating his pairs and playing these bigger cards and move away from trying to flop sets all the time because that's kind of burning money against someone with a wide range who's not paying you off so we can defend our blinds much more like you'll get legs who decide to open your blind just all the time every opportunity they get and we're going to see this in the examples and how I'm sort of reacting to it there's a guy who just starts opening my blind like 80% of the time. Um, and when that happens blind versus blind, it can be a bit annoying because your immediate instinct is like, I'm going to 3-bet this guy. But just remember that when you're blind versus blind, of course you can throw in some 3-bet bluffs. Why not? Against most people. As long as he's like one, not one of these guys who never folds and is always going to 4-bet you right back. Um, but against most people, of course you can throw a few in. But even more importantly, like, you have position there, that's the difference, like, he's stealing your blind, but this time you have position. You don't have that when he's on the cutoff or the button. But blind versus blind, you have position, you can defend, and then you're just going to make so much more money the times you connect well with flops post-flop, because you're in position, you're going to lose less when you miss, and you're going to just play better overall, and you're going to have more opportunities to float, like, you don't get out of position, you're going to have more opportunities to raise, because your opponent's, like, not able to call out of position, and then play with no initiative, these kind of things, like, it's just overall a much better world for you blind versus blind, so if you've got a lag who's pounding on your blinds relentlessly, you probably want to think about just flatting really wide, and we'll get onto more of that later when we get to the example hands. Um, we should tighten up our stealing ranges because when we're stealing really wide, we're doing it because we want to get lots of folds, right? We're going to take down the pot pre-flop, you know, if we open like 8-5 offsuit on the button, it's not because we think it plays well post-flop. Obviously it doesn't, it's more just so we can take down the pot. And that's it, basically. However, the lag is going to defend his blinds a lot more, he's going to 3-bit out the blinds, flat out the blinds, make our life difficult, therefore it makes, you know, it's common sense to sort of tighten up our opening ranges or stealing ranges. We're not going to abuse him like we would the tag or the net, because he won't let us away with it. So we're going to tighten up so that when he does start combating us and playing back at us, we've got a stronger range and we can do a hell of a lot more about it more often. So. Definitely, we want to tighten up a little bit. We don't want to become like nets in late position. Of course, we still want to be wide. There may be other players in the blinds who are weak that we want to play with, but we need to bear that in mind as a factor and not open crazy wide when someone's playing well against it. So post slop, I mean, a wide range is easier to attack. So be vigilant for good boards to go after. Good boards are like, you know, it's a very long-winded thing for me to get into right now. The, I'll do a video about board texture, I'm sure I've done videos about board texture and check raising and playing back and floating and stuff before, but just look for spots where your opponent's range is weak, you can rep stuff and it's going to be difficult for them to continue, especially if you have equity or you have good turn cards to barrel, these kind of things. Be aware of that because the lag has a wider range, he has more air, so he's going to have to fold more to aggression post-flop, in general. If he's really spewy and doesn't fold, then hey, you won't bluff him, but most lags you know, there are more opportunities to go after them post-flop because they play wider ranges, so they miss more often. Like a flop like Ace-7-3 dry rainbow, which is really good for like a Nets opening range because he just it hits his range so well. It doesn't hit a lag's range all that well and you can probably rep more Aces than he can. These kind of things. Your range becomes stronger than his in a lot of spots. And when your range is stronger than your opponent's, you want to be bluffing more and just putting more money into the pot in general. Have a think about that. Um, so bluff catching also becomes more paramount, like I said, the, the lag is generally going to be firing off more barrels, so you should be more inclined to call down a bit wider, we'll get into that later in the examples as well. You know, if someone's bluffing more, of course you need to be bluff catching more, your bluff catchers are, 
you know, actually strong hands in the sense that if he's just aggro all the time, you're going to get to showdown and win more. A bad lag can be over aggro, so inducing and slow playing can work against the lag for sure. If this guy, I mean, a good a good lag can be over aggro too. If you think a guy is going to put loads and loads of pressure on you on a certain board because it's a board that's really good for his range, it's getting better and better for his range. Overcards are falling, flushes are getting there, and your calling range is becoming like more and more vulnerable. For instance, these kind of situations, if you think the guy is going to be like hammering you with bet after bet, and you have a set, and you're not so worried about him having that many flushes or whatever, then you can just slow play, wait till you get to the river, and then raise after he's built a huge pot, and get value there. I mean, there's no point like scaring the guy off if you think he's going to go crazy and try and get fold equity and try and make you fold lots. So, inducing and slow playing do have their place. Also, if he's really imaginative, like you can induce by betting really small on the river, for instance, and sort of repping a very capped weak range, and then have him come over the top as a bluff. If you've got the nuts, these kind of things, there are time and a place for them. Um, and against certain lags, definitely they they come up quite a lot. Good spots for them come up quite a bit. So, also a good lag will be skilled in hand reading, so balance your range. So if a lag is a good player, he's going to be generally a very good player because he's capable of playing this looser style um, and all of that, all of the harder decision making that comes with that. So he's going to be good, he's going to be thinking about your range, so you need to be a bit more balanced. Like, if you never raise a set for value on 8, 6, 3, rainbow, and he knows that, and you never raise an overpair for value because it's too thin, and then you raise that board for instance, your range is so incredibly unbalanced, like all you have is air, that he's going to be able to play very well against you. So it's just things like this. Against a good hand reader, a lag who's a good hand reader, you definitely need to be balancing your range, merging your range a little bit. Um, this isn't stuff you need to worry about if you're at the micros and, or anything like that, because you will rarely come across regs who are that good at hand reading, um, or lags that are that competent, generally. The best players at 25 no limit are the tags, and any legs you come across are typically sort of weaker players that are trying a bit too hard and just doing things they don't really understand and stuff like that. Otherwise, they'd have moved up, especially if they've been at those games for a while. A real telltale sign of a bad lag is someone who's been at the same game for like a year and just doesn't move up, especially if that's like 25 and L or lower. All right, so let's get into the example hands now. Uh, this first one. So all these all these hands are going to be against the same player, and it's going to be this C O H one B triple A guy. Okay, so his stats are twenty five twenty one with a forty six attempt to steal, and he, as you can see, he's twenty six percent in the cutoff, which is very wide. Fifty percent in the button, which is very wide, and eighty three percent in small blind, which is just phenomenally, like terribly wide. I would say, like that can't be profitable against anyone who's actually aware and is going to defend enough. Um, otherwise across the board he's just typically very aggressive he's raising 38% of flops it would have been a bit lower I think when these hands were actually played because these hands typically involve him raising flops but yeah he's still someone who can raise a lot of flops his one win his one money when soft flop is 48 which is fairly high and um, that's very high num that's a high number because he's the type of guy that fights for a lot of pots like he wants to pick up little pots and that's the case like when your range is weaker, you can't just play fit or fold if you're a lag, you have to protect that weaker range with a bit of aggression and make life difficult for your opponent, so he's certainly doing that. And his turn C bet here is 63, which is also very large, and his 3.3 aggression is it's very aggressive considering that he runs 25-21. These stats of mine, by the way, 26-22, I'm not actually that loose, that's because there are some heads up hands mixed up, I don't know what this 95k is, I don't know why it hasn't just included my whole database, but whatever hands these are, it includes some heads up. I actually run like 23, 20, more like that, sort of looser end of being a tag. Okay, so let's get into this first hand. He opens the button to two, he's min raising his button basically, which is pretty sensible when you're opening seriously wide, like you want to be risking the minimum to take down the blinds, especially if people aren't defending a whole lot. I mean, I don't, I mean I flat like 30% out of the big blind. I defend my blind 30% of the time, so I'm flatting quite a lot there. In the small blind, I'm fairly tight because there are often squeezers ahead of me in these games and stuff like that. So here, I'm not so comfortable flatting, not really because I don't think it's good enough to flat. It certainly is against a seriously wide range. Queen Jack offsuit is doing fine, and I can look to mess about and sort of attack his wide range, like we were saying post flop. 
but the problem is that there's angry reg here and angry reg by the sounds of it by the sound of his name and his stats is likely to squeeze me and this guy a decent amount of time therefore i just can't be flatting here in the small blind and not seeing flops so i decide to three bet he doesn't fold that much to three bets only 30 percent however i will get folds like a decent amount just because he can't like he still folds 30 percent right so i'm still going to get folds from the very bottom of his range i don't I don't believe that he's going to play like 8-3 suited here against me and stuff. There are a lot of fans he's going to have to fold. However, he is going to play back at me with anything that looks decent. Any sort of pair, any suited connector that's like decent looking and any sort of Broadway hands. But that's okay because Queen Jack is actually ahead of a lot of those random suited connectors and Broadways. It will be dominated but it will dominate at other times. So it's going to play okay. Being out of position, it's marginal this 3 bit but the thing is that I want to have some sort of bluffing range and this is about as good as it gets with you know hands that I'm not happy flatting so this is like the top of my folding range so it becomes a good hand to 3 bit bluff and I wouldn't 3 bit bluff this guy very much but this is such a good hand for it that I'm, I need to be balanced like I was saying against these guys you have to be balanced I can't just start 3 betting for value so he flats and the flop comes ace queen 6 I decide to check here because betting is kind of it's okay to bet here another line is to bet here and then check call the turn and check fold the river that'd be my other plan and my thought behind it would be he's going to float this flop a lot with gut shots and random stuff um so make a half foot c bet and then check call a turn and stab basically because i expect him to float a lot his fold to c bet is very low it's only 15 percent however he raises c bet so much so i don't particularly want to get raised here I mean, he does look full of shit if he raises this flop. I'm a little bit uncomfortable like with such a weak hand um, out of position here if I get raised. So I decide to check pot control. If he decides to stab at this, I'm going to call. And then probably give up on the turn because it just doesn't look like I'm... I'm not going to check all like nines here. That's just too weak. So the minimum thing I can have is like a hand like Queen Jack or I have like an ace that isn't ever folding. So I don't think he's going to go crazy barreling me here because he's an aware player. Like he knows what's going on, this guy. So but it's a bit of sort of metagame hand reading that kind of stuff and metagame becomes pretty important against I probably should have mentioned that but you know the ebb and flow of how the game is going is very very important and that's where we get our specific reads from so the king comes on the turn and I check and I check again again there's no reason to bet here for me because he's gonna fold anything worse basically like queen 10 is like the only worst hand I can see calling something like queen 9 suited maybe uh, push, but generally he's going to either have a king in his hand, which will just call me. If he does have an ace, an ace rag type hand, he's going to call me. And if he has anything worse, he's just going to fold or bluff, and I can't do anything about it if he bluffs here. So he, I let him bet the turn instead. This is good because he is flatting my three bet with like a bunch of eight hands that are still air here. He can have a hand like pocket fives that's just like far too weak for him to go to showdown with, or a hand like sevens, and just take a stab at this now, hoping I've got like tens and I'm going to fold or something. So, he can definitely be bluffing this turn. He can, and his value range is quite thin here. Like, he can have jack 10, but I think he's going to stab on the flop if he has, like, a gut shot and no showdown value. So, I discount that slightly. Um, I don't think he has that many combos of it. And I think if he has an ace, he usually bets the flop for value. And the only thing I'm really afraid of here is something like king 6 suited, king queen, um, maybe jack 10, or maybe something like... Yeah, that's really it. There's not too much I'm worried about. So, I'm going to definitely call here then evaluate the river I'm probably gonna call the river as well because I just think that he ends up checking giving up he had them um, eight seven suited he made a pair in the end if he didn't make a pair he might have bet but I'm probably gonna call again because again his value range is just really small he doesn't have that many strong hands because he's gonna bet an ace on the flop so I can't give him like ever an ace queen ace king ace jack or anything like that I can only really just give him king queen and jack ten so and maybe some random two pair combos like ace eight so yeah, I'd, I mean, I don't even think he bets a ragged ace on the river again. His value range is very small, so I'd probably check call the river as it is. I don't need to. I win the pot anyway. This next one, um, we're blind versus blind. I'm going to be, remember, like I said, we need to be careful how wide we open a guy's range who's going to be playing back at us a lot in position. But King-10 officer is too strong to ever fold, so this is a snap open. But I would be a bit more conservative than usual in this spot. So we open, he calls, we see bet this flop, fairly standard, we have a back there flush draw, straight draw, back there straight draw, and, and an overcard. So we have like a good amount of turns we can bet here, club turns, ace turns, jack turns, all give us equity, king turns, ten turns, make us the best hand most of the time. So we're very happy see betting here with 
you know, look into the future with confidence for f the future streams. He raises to 10, it makes a very small raise. Um, so what does he have here for value? We know this guy likes to raise flops, we know he likes to fight for pots, he's a very high 1 win soft flop, a very high raise c bet. We know he's going to be picking on us here quite a bit, because our range is wide, blind versus blind, and we're always c bet in this flop. So what does he have for value? 4s and 5s, that's only 6 combos. Does he even raise like king-queen, queen-jack? Maybe not. Does he 3 bet ace-queen pre-flop? Probably. Is he 3-bet king-queen? Possibly. So we're discounting a lot of value hands here. Fundamentally he has draws and he has air. But he doesn't have that many draws because we have the king of clubs. So that's a lot of flush draws gone. He does have some other flush draws. Not flush draws and like stuff like 6-8 of clubs and stuff like that. But he's raising this flop with such a high frequency in my opinion that he's going to have air more off, much more often than he's going to have like 6-7 or clubs here. So given that we're only really afraid of, s of sets and draws, and that isn't as many combos as air, I decided to make a 3-bet here as a bluff. Now the downside to this is that he can shove a draw over me and I have to fold my king high, and it might be good a lot of the time. But that's okay because, like I say, he just has air so much more frequently that we're happy if he, you know, we're happy to do this, give ourselves quite a good price and then fold. I could even make it smaller, I can make it like 24 because we're just really targeting his air. Um, and I think my sizing is a bit too big. I think we need to make it more like 24 bro, 23 24 dollars, but I like the idea of 3 bin. Next one we have Ace King off. And this is fairly standard actually, and maybe shouldn't have even included this, but we'll take a brief look at it. He calls blind versus blind again, similar spot. This hand happened like a couple of orbits later. We see about the flop, and he raises again. And here, I mean, this is the thing I can flat. But then it's very obvious if I'm flatting out a position here that I have a strong hand. I don't think he's going to barrel me on this texture because it's just too likely I have an ace because I'm not going to float out of position here probably unless we have some other dynamic. So I decide to 3-bet again just because I 3-bet before and maybe I can get him to jam like a flush draw on me here which is awesome because I have loads of equity again so I'll get him to jam as a bluff. Um, as it turned out he folds but yeah. Next one. This is another blind versus blind hand, but now it's us on the big blind. Now remember what I was saying before, when someone is opening 83% of your blinds, like you can't fold queen six suited, because he's opening like almost anything in the small blind, and this is like the average hand, and we have position, and it's suited. So it's going to play well enough, we just need to be defending loads. I would 3-bet bluff some hands here, but this is like, against someone who never folds the 3-bets, I'd rather just do it quite wide for value instead, and just flat a hand like this. And then 3 bit bluff, like some combos that I'm not happy to flat with, but not too many because he's not folding much. Flop comes jack 6 2 and he bets. This is obviously a standard call for us because he's c betting this flop all day, 75% of the time. This flop probably 100%. 10 comes in the turn, he bets again. Right. So our hand now looks kind of marginal, but he's always going to bet air on this turn because his turn barrel is 63%. So there's no way in hell he doesn't bet air here, basically. He's always betting his air. Um, so he's going to have on this turn for value he's going to have like obviously over pairs sets and then like some two pair and then jacks which is some a decent amount of combos but when you think that he's opening 83% of hands it's not that many there's a lot of air here and there aren't there's also a lot of air that just has like no equity he could have like pocket fours here he could have like three four suited just like hands with very little equity here um, he will have hands with more equity such as like king queen ace queen but we're favourite against those as well, and you know I don't think he's going to bluff the river. Why do I not think he's going to bluff the river? Because when we call this turn, we usually have a jack. Like if we have a hand like a six, that's the kind of hand he's trying to make us fold. He probably expects us to fold that on the turn. So if he bets the river, he has to think that we are folding a jack or better, and that's just really not ever the case, and he's going to know that. So I'm very comfortable calling this turn, because I don't think he's going to bet the river as a bluff, and then I'm going to fold the river. So that's my plan, that's what I do. That's like the best river ever for us because he's never in any way in hell going to bluff this one. Because now we have jacks more often, it's less likely he has a jack. If we randomly floated with a 10, we're now never folding. If we have like pocket 8s, we may not even be folding on this card, you know, from a first level sort of point of thinking. If he's trying to level me, he could bet here as a bluff. But the problem is I just have a jack too often. I just have trips way, way, way too often for him to be able to do anything. My range is just way stronger than his range here when I call two streets and that river falls. So basically he has to give up a lot of the time. 
Turns out he actually had a 6, so this guy, even with a bit of showdown value, decided to turn it into a bluff to try and get us to fold some stuff, so... Yeah, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's betting many rivers there. Maybe like an ace or a king or something, but probably that's it, you know? And if he bets a queen, that's good for us, because we make two pair. Okay, that's the end of my example hands, and the end of my video. Hope you enjoyed that little instalment about how to neutralize the lag. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments, as always, and I'm going to see you guys on the next video where we're going to be talking about how to spot player types. So that should be exciting. Looking forward to that. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.